How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure Good evening, everybody. Let me preface what we're about to do. We're going to do something a little bit different tonight. I preface what I'm about to do by addressing most visitors and people who might be here for the first time. Now, this is not usually what we do on a Sunday night, okay? Just so you know that. This is not generally what we do on a Sunday night. Uh, so bear with me a little bit, and I think you can still learn, and you'll definitely learn some things about Calvary Baptist Church. We cannot control the definitions that words take on over time, right? Uh, you have a term or a word, and we have that problem with the King James Bible all the time. There'll be some word in the King James Bible that the word prevent. The definition has changed. We can't control that. Now, we may lament the fact that it has changed. We may not be happy with the fact that it has changed, but the reality is the definition of the word has changed. So, you really can't use that word in that context anymore because people will get the wrong impression of what you're trying to say. Are you following me? Okay. Nobody said yes, but okay. Uh, <laughs> there's some words. And if you look outside of our church, we have a sign there. It says Calvary Baptist Church. And on the bottom, there's a few words. It says independent, fundamental, evangelistic. Now, what does independent mean? Somebody tell me what independent means. Just in general, what does independent mean? Denise? Not on their own. Yeah. It's kind of on, on our own. We're not affiliated with any denomination or a, or a religious hierarchy or anything like that. Calvary Baptist Church has no affiliations. Where are you out here? Independent. Independent just means basically you're on your own, okay? Basically. The next word there says independent and it says fundamental. Anybody know what fundamental means? I mean, just at the root, what the word means, I mean, at the most basic level, it's the basics, the fundamentals, okay? So independent, fundamental, and then it says evangelistic. Okay? Now I want to do mainly with independent fundamental. So if you say, I am an independent fundamental Baptist, what do you say? You're saying, we stand alone, we're not affiliated, we believe in the basics, the fundamental truths of Christianity, and we are Baptists. Now, is that all you think of when you hear the term independent fundamental Baptist? Oh, they must be independent, they must believe in the fundamentals. That's good. Is that all you think about when you hear independent fundamental? What are some other things that you might think about when you hear independent fundamental Baptist? Okay, so uh, independent fundamental. Natasha has a certain impression, Tony has an impression, others have an impression. That's a good example because we cannot control the definition of those words. So Natasha drives by our church and sees independent fundamental where she has a history, where she has experienced legalism within those types of churches. So when she sees those phrases, she attaches to it that meaning. Tony goes by and sees independent fundamental, and he attaches to it whatever experience he has, and he has his own definition. I can't control that, and you can't control that. See, what has happened is that you label a church independent, say, brand new, never ever before been a church called an independent fundamental church. Never ever before. We found a church, we call it independent fundamental. Okay. What are we? Well, we're a church, and we believe the fundamentals are independent. Another church pops up, another church, another church, another church. Independent fundamental, independent fundamental, independent fundamental. Okay? Uh, over time, those churches will develop certain characteristics. Right? They will develop certain characteristics in their teaching, their preaching style, uh, their approach to, to, uh, to uh, Christian behavior and things like that. They will develop certain characteristics. Now, because they've taken this title upon themselves, and they all have very similar characteristics, those characteristics will become the definition of those terms, right? So that if another church pops up and says, well, hey, I'm independent, I believe in the fundamentals, I'm a Baptist, but I don't really hold to all the characteristics that these other churches have. So what do I call myself? I am independent, I am fundamental, I am a Baptist, but I, I don't really do worship the same way they do it. I don't really take the same stand on outward standards that they do. I, I might not have as uh, militant a, an approach to a Bible version that they do. So what now do I call myself? Do you understand how the change in definitions can create some problems there? Well, before we get into 
uh, some other things I want to talk about. I want to talk about Calvary Baptist Church in particular. Okay? We have what we call a biblical philosophy of ministry. Does anybody remember any of the points of our biblical philosophy of ministry? Jared? First one is a high view of God. Yes, and he even knows the first one. A high view of God. So at Calvary Baptist Church, one of the things that guides all that we do is a high view of God. A high view of God. That is, we believe He is sovereign, He is eternal, He is self-existent, He's all-powerful, He's all-knowing, He's all-present, He's always present, He's unchanging, and we elevate God, and that determines what we do. So when we preach and teach and the things that we do, they're done with reverence. They're done with respect to a holy God, and we hold Him up in very high regard. That's not true of all churches. You can see other churches that are very based in the things that they do. I remember listening to an interview of one pastor who uh, decided he was going to open his Easter service with secular heavy metal. And uh, he said that's what he wanted to do to anger, quote unquote, the religious people. Here's the pastor saying this. Okay? Well, to me, that conveys a very low view of God. To play with the pulpit and to play with uh, the church service that way. Uh, very disrespectful and irreverent as far as I'm concerned. So you're not going to see that happen at Calvary Baptist Church. Bob is very relieved. Right? <laughs> so, we believe that God is holy and righteous and just and He's jealous and He's loving and merciful and gracious, long-suffering, forgiving, and we elevate Him. We elevate His character and that's how we conduct our worship and our services at Calvary Baptist Church. We believe that God alone deserves glory. You know what that's going to do too for me as a pastor? Is that when I'm up behind the pulpit, I'm not trying to garner followers of me and my theology. I'm not trying to get you to follow me and my peculiar approach to ministry or my peculiar approach to doctrine. Uh, I'm not coming up here and taking some novel approach to a passage of scripture trying to get you to fall in line with my interpretation. And that's not what it's about because it's not about me. I don't want there to be uh, <coughs> followers of Rick Count, right? I don't want uh, an ite to be added to the end of my name, okay? I'm a Rickite. No, uh, that's not what I want, and you don't want to be called that either, right? <clears throat> so, we have a high view of God. So God gets all the glory. He gets all the glory through the preaching. He gets all the glory through how we do ministry. And uh, I don't want His glory. I want that to be deflected to Him. So you'll see that reflected in the way that we preach and teach and we approach ministry. Number two, anybody know what else? Oh, we got more hands this time. Josh. Yeah, well, that's coming but anybody know number two? Peggy? Affirmation of the sufficiency of God's word. An affirmation of the of God's word. This also influences the way we preach and teach, right? Because I believe if I preach the word of God, the word of God is sufficient. What do I not need to supplement the word of God with? All right. If we believe the word of God is sufficient, that means that I believe I get up and preach the word of God plainly and clearly, and that preaching will be effectual. Not because I did anything in it of my own power, because I was the intelligent one who decided to word it such a way or to supplement it with this illustration or that joke or that anecdote or that story, but I believe I can preach the Word of God plainly, and that's why our pattern is generally is to preach in an expository manner, except for tonight, right? <laughs> I said it before you said it. Uh, that's generally our practice, because we believe the Word of God is sufficient. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, we read it this morning, says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye, the Thessalonian church, received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as the, it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. I believe the word of God effectually works in believers. That is, if somebody's a believer, the Holy Spirit inside of them, and they learn biblical truth, the Holy Spirit can change that person through his word. Right? So I don't need... To go and in my own mind, in my to go and confront somebody or rebuke them uh, immediately, but I rely upon the word and the spirit to change somebody. I believe that God uses the word that way. The word is effectual; it effectually works in those that believe. So we believe the word of God is sufficient, and that's my philosophy as a pastor. So we focus on preaching the word of God as it appears in the Bible. I'm not trying to find a novel approach. I'm not trying to find something uh, uh, peculiar that you've never heard before of a passage. That's not my job. In fact, if I come up with a sermon, and when I've been preparing a sermon, I read a commentary or somebody else's sermon, and it's very, very similar to what I have just preached, I think to myself, wow, 
I must have interpreted that passage accurately. Because other men who have gone on before me have come to the very same conclusions. And that's not a discouragement to me, that's an encouragement to me, because I just want to teach what the Bible says. How many of you, the last couple of years or so, um, have found your desire uh, towards Scripture, your desire to read and study Scripture in the last couple of years, how many of you have, have found that desire increase? Yeah, are you going to wait out lots of hands? Good. Okay. Why is that? It has nothing to do with me. What it has to do with is the fact that as a church, we have adopted a philosophy of ministry that seeks to simply preach and teach the Word of God, believing it is sufficient. So we dig into it. A high view of God, an affirmation of the sufficiency of Scripture. Number three. Anybody know what number three is? Peggy? A recognition of the Spirit's ministry. Yeah. A recognition of the Spirit's ministry. Natasha mentioned legalism. What is legalism? Legalism is the exact opposite of a recognition of the Spirit's ministry. Legalism says, I want somebody to change, so in order for them to change, I have to pressure them outwardly. A recognition of the Spirit's ministry means that we are going to pray for somebody and preach and teach the Word to them and encourage them in their Christian life so that the Spirit changes them inwardly. See the difference? Yes. And we've taught this before. So the difference between legalism... And believing the Spirit has a ministry in the heart of a man is that of outward pressure versus inward pressure. So we teach the Word, we pray, we encourage people to grow spiritually, and guess what happens? People change. Sometimes you can see external changes. But it started on the inside and it worked its way to the outside, and it was not a church trying to put outward legalistic uh, requirements on somebody, okay? John 14, 17, it says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. That's the Spirit. He's in us, and he works in us. In John 14, it tells us he will teach us all things. That's the Spirit in us who works. How does that apply to how we preach and teach salvation, by the way? We believe the Spirit is a very active, vibrant, real Practical ministry today, how does that affect the way we preach the gospel message? Jesus said that no man can come to him except the Father draws him, and the Father draws people to Christ through the work of the Spirit. So, we preach the Word. God blesses the Word. Remember, the Word is sufficient. We preach the Word. The Spirit uses the Word, and He draws men to Himself through the Scriptures. So, on a Sunday morning, if I'm preaching a message and we're dealing with the gospel, salvation message, the preaching goes out, the Spirit energizes it, and through the preaching of the Word, God draws people to Himself. You know why that's encouraging? Because if you have an unsaved friend or family member that you want to be saved, and you're a little bit nervous about approaching that person, there's a whole lot that can be done through prayer. Because God uses His Spirit to draw people to Himself, and you can have influence on that person and them coming to Christ simply by praying for them, because God is sovereign in salvation. Right? Okay. Recognition of the Spirit's ministry. An accurate view of man's nature. The Bible teaches us that we are all dead in trespasses and sins. In Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, we are all dead in trespasses and sins. There is none righteous, no, not one. Uh, we cannot please God in our flesh. In Romans chapter 8. Uh, this is the nature of man. I recognize that somebody that does, that does not have Christ does not need reformation. They need to be regenerated. They need to be made new on the inside because of their dead spiritual nature. Number five is a correct understanding of the purpose of the church. Why do we exist? We exist to worship and glorify God. We exist to be a repository of divine truth. 1 Timothy 3.15 It says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. This is where the truth ought to be found. Okay? Uh, we ought to be defenders of right doctrine. That's the purpose of the church. And we exist to provide a context of loving fellowship with one another. You got to be able to come here and be encouraged and edified in the church. We exist as a place to train up people to grow and uh, to be used in the ministry, according to Ephesians 4. And we exist to be a light in the dark world when it comes to evangelization. And uh, you look at the Great Commission to see that. Godly, qualified leadership.
that is the church calls men out to leadership that they have observed and they recognize the qualities laid out in scripture and that those men are ordained for leadership. Okay? And uh, yeah, I was getting ahead of myself trying to rush through that. Okay, so that's our biblical philosophy of ministry in a nutshell. Okay, in a nutshell. There's much to be said under all those things. Now, back to how we started all this at our sign. On that sign, it says Independent Fundamental Evangelistic. Okay, Calvary Baptist Church, Independent Fundamental Evangelistic. Today in the Christian realm, independent fundamental does no longer mean independent fundamental. What independent fundamental means, it has taken on all the characteristics of a body of churches, and it has, be, it, it has come to be defined by how those particular churches conduct themselves in ministry. And the question we need to ask ourselves at Calvary Baptist Church is, do we uh, agree with uh, the way that this body of churches conduct themselves? And if somebody were to look at our sign or to look at our church and hear the terms independent and fundamental, which makes them associate us with this other body, something we cannot control, if that makes them associate us with them, are we okay with that? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Are we okay with that? And if we're not okay with that, uh, what do we do about it? Okay? Well, I'm going to talk to you for a couple minutes about some of the things within that body of churches that, frankly, I, I think we should have a problem with or that we might not agree with. In many of these things, you have already come to the place where you recognize them, but uh, I've just never, we've never presented them in this context before. 